This is Sound Notion. Sort of. If you're watching the video, you can see that there's probably something a little wrong with us today, and that is that us is nobody. You can see the Skype monitor is empty. I'm not talking to anyone but you. Uh, this is our best of 2012 show, and we're all taking a couple weeks off to spend the holidays with friends and family and do some travel. So instead of doing a regular episode for the next couple of weeks, we are going to put out uh, what we think is a kind of compilation of some of our best moments of the year. Uh, it's been another great year for Sound Notion. It's our second year, uh, and we always find that some of our favorite moments of the show uh, are all centered around the guests that we have on the show. So if uh, you watch the show regularly, you probably know we've gotten to talk to some really incredible people this year, some of our favorite musicians, our favorite composers, um, and some really interesting members of the classical music community that, that uh, speak very well about our world and where it's headed. And uh, we like to revisit those from time to time. We've, we've really gotten to talk to some people that we honestly, and I'm, I'm not just blowing smoke, we honestly admire in our world. So uh, we're going to put together a few of these for you today. I hope you enjoy it. Um, and I'll kind of pop in a couple of times throughout. But in, enjoy some of our, our best moments of Sound Notion from 2012. Reading has always been kind of a big uh, part of my life, and it's kind of a therapy or, or whatever. And, and I, so I see the writing as partly, as you can imagine, because, well, most of you are composers, right? Yes. yes. Uh, almost yes. except for Tim, who's a closet yeah, a, composer. Clo <laughs> closeted composer. Well, <laughs> you can come out anytime you want. Uh, <laughs> pride Week, man. <laughs> it, it's Pride Week. Uh, I guess, you know, it's so solitary playing the piano. Uh, and it's so obsessive and compulsive. Um, and I have all these kind of thoughts that, you know, naturally come out of practicing for hours and hours. And and for some reason, I find writing a, the, the act of translating the musical experience into words sometimes very calming and kind of, and it also in, inspires me from a different, um, it's like my other, my other little devil on my other shoulder is suddenly speaking to me and that I'm able to, um, to get some somewhere with the music that I maybe wouldn't if I was just obsessively practicing the whole time. So, um, you know, it's just an outgrowth of, of I love books, I love reading, I love interesting prose, I love funny prose. Um, I tried to make the New Yorker piece kind of funny to um, to reflect yeah. some of the perversity of being a class musician in the modern world. Yeah, um, yeah. I definitely they, like they that part about... It was much 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 more uh, insanely sarcastic piece when I started it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you went through all those takes, and then you figured out the original take was the one you were going to <laughs> going to incorporate into the album. I mean, you know, yes, that that is a classic moment you know, when you're, <laughs> you enter that hall of mirrors and recording because it's like looking at yourself in a million different takes, right? And you seem to recognize something great that you want in one take, and then. But then it, it, the more you listen to it, the less fresh that inspiration seems. And so there's this horrible sense of, you know, looking for a freshness through all this sort of pre-taped material. Uh, and there's such a contradiction there. And obviously that's like the whole nightmare of, of recording. And that's why you have yeah. a produced round, of course, to sort of be the voice of sanity or the voice of the outside right. world as they might hear it. And... Um, you know, my interactions with him often are comic because when when an insane person interacts with a sane person, then it's going to be funny sometimes. Which is which? <laughs> I, I I hope that it was clear in the, in the piece that I considered <laughs> myself mainly to be the insane person. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I mean, there are certain things that uh, Adam, my wonderful producer, has to do to keep things going and everyone happy. You know, and he always he kind of slightly errs on the side of making me feel good. You know, like a like a handler would, you know, and he's always like reassuring me and giving me lots of, you know, extra <laughs> compliments and, you know, telling me maybe I need to take a little nap or a little downtime, you know, and it's sort of infantilizing, you know, at the same time, the whole recording process. Right. Um, you regress back to a very early, early person. Yeah. Well, from the, from the perspective of a composer, if you recorded a bunch of versions and ended up using the first one, um, it's just that if you only recorded it once, you didn't torture yourself enough. 
Um, oh, you know, right. Yeah. You have to feel tortured like it was a grueling process before you move on. So that's, at least in my experience, that's the way it is as a composer. So you, right. you, if you end up using the first one, you still got to try it 25 more times just so you suffer. <laughs> yes, there's a certain level of suffering, and I think the, the producer wants to be safe. But there were a couple of the Ligeti etudes that we did in, in one uh, take. And, mm-hmm. and in some ways, I think um, uh, much of the second movement of the Beethoven is in, is in one take also. And it was the first take. And after that, I, somehow I couldn't put myself into that stream the same way the second time or the third time. And I can always tell when Adam is like, oh, you know, that was great, but he, <laughs> you can tell that it really wasn't as great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that piece really spoke to me uh, because although I'm not a composer, I uh, am a recording engineer and a performer. And so I was, it, you know, you were speaking to me from both sides, the, the part where you mentioned that you wake up in the morning and, and you realize that you have to play this piece better than you've ever played it before. And, um, and then the, the, the part that you were just talking about where you're in the studio and, and having the artist there with you picking their, their parts that they think are the best and then realizing that it was really just the first one the whole time. The whole um, time, yeah. Yeah, I've been on both sides of that. And it was, it was really nice to have your work saying it because you've said it better than I ever have so anytime I uh, do a project r- recording again I'm just going to hand that article out to the artist first <laughs> Good. I'm, glad, I'm glad it came across that way because you know when they asked me about this idea I didn't I wasn't entirely thrilled because I was like well everyone knows what a recording is like but they're like no actually people don't really know and and then I was like it's not something you can even narrate it's not a story because it's like the most it's actually the most tedious imaginable right uh, kind of thing and so i started abstracting certain moments from the recording it's like a recording is like it's like an endless expanse of miserable time in which these recurring (laughs) uh, surreal tropes happen right and then then he's like well yeah okay so put those tropes down let's hear what the the things are that happen in the recording and make and make it into the narrative and i was like oh well okay and i did and uh and i tried to tell it in a very honest hopefully way yeah, that's that's an interesting thing to point out to people that the creative process is often very very boring. Um, you know, we watch we watch reality shows that deal with creativity, and they make it seem yes. very exciting. What's the, what's the art one? Is work of art? Is that a thing? Work of art. Work of, work of yeah. art and uh, Project Runway. And mm-hmm. you know, you, you see this, and they're they're always doing something for at least you know an hour minus commercial breaks. Yes, uh, right. But it, I can't imagine. Like Sam's doing this this two week composition thing, and I know there are there are other even faster uh, composition contests like that where you just get like an afternoon or something. And I imagine what a reality show about that would be, and it would be the most boring thing I could possibly. I would never watch the show, and yeah. you know it's about my people, as as one would say. Yeah, here's an exciting video of Sam reading the Wikipedia entry for Jig. <laughs> And then here's Sam yeah. staring at the wall and thinking about it for 14 minutes. Yeah. I was, I was just um, <clears throat> reading that posthumous David Foster Wallace uh, book about the, the, the Pale King or whatever it is, and it's about IRS agents. And there's some wonderful passages in there about boredom and tasks, you know, and certain kinds of tasks that you do over time and how much of a lie, you know. I mean, the amount of crap that we we see about making art or how you rehearse or practice, you know, making music is one of the most ridiculously distorted things in the media because, you know, most of the effort couldn't be filmed. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, when I first heard them in in the early nineties, I heard a couple in, um, Mm -hmm. in Bloomington, the master class. And, um, I thought immediately that this music was, was special and and pianistic in a way that not much uh, music is uh, these days. Um, and then, you know, I noticed it was like required or optional anyway, etude for the opening round of tons of competitions, right? So um, already you have this kind of absorption of these etudes into the mainstream of piano competition world, which means that you're going to have lots of young kids practicing them 
Um, but I mean, it's music that everybody knows. If you go to a conservatory or you, you know, you talk to students and right, you know, it's not the same with you know Warren and something or other or right. It's uh, right, or, right. You know, these pieces are they're iconic and and also partly maybe because they're so ridiculous. Like, how do you even imagine <laughs> playing the first one? You know, right. for many years, I didn't even think. I mean, I didn't even think I would bother to learn some of them because they seemed so preposterous. The amount of hours you would have to spend. Yeah, but I, then, yeah. Go ahead. go ahead. I was just gonna say it's one of those one of those scores that you look at and your first reaction is to laugh. You know, like that's that's ridiculous. Yeah. Who, totally. You know what I mean? Is, is, is you, have you guys had this experience? Oh, oh yeah. my god! Okay. Of course I have. Yeah. <laughs> I play the saxophone. <laughs> but sometimes my name is on the score. To, no, a... Right. I played all of your music. So, yes. Deceptive Cadence blog has a piece about how kids pick instruments. And uh, I love the Deceptive Cadence blog usually, but this one is completely ridiculous because they don't mention... <laughs> They don't mention anything about all the. All they See, talk you about, know what I like about you is how diplomatic you are when you disagree <laughs> with people. It's ridiculous because they only mention band and orchestra instruments, and and then they make the point that kids are uh, inspired to play by what they listen to. Well, not many kids listen to oboe sonatas. A lot of them listen to music made by turntables and laptops and computer software, and they don't mention. Oh. It's sort of like they're they're assuming that if if a kid is going to learn how to play an instrument, the only instruments that they have to choose from are band and orchestra instruments, and and, and recorder, and there's all kinds of uh, <laughs> other musical possibilities for kids these days that they just completely disregard as if they don't exist. So shame on you, um, uh, Deceptive Cadence blog. Well, I would blame from the top. Yeah. And this there well there well yeah we won't even get into that but I'm not going to get I'm not going to get into my from the top beef I have, I have beef with from the top Dave hates nope, from I'm, the top I'm not going to talk about from the top <laughs> I'll stay completely out of it Yeah me too Partly I, I've never even seen or I've not, I don't I don't really know from the top It's uh it's so, a show where they Oh, I know what it is, okay. but I, I never, I've never witnessed the actual thing. So yeah, I, I haven't either, but I, I, I know everything I need to know about it. Well, <laughs> I, I like it just because the guy that runs it did uh, the Radiohead piano album, which is cool. Uh, yes, yeah. yeah. All right. I'll, I haven't heard that either, even though I, that's a completely idiotic uh, thing for me to neglect. But I haven't. Well, it, it, the only downside is he wears a completely ridiculous tuxedo in concert too, though. <laughs> What's his name? Oh, uh, outfits and concerts are a whole terrible neurosis of mine, and I went Let's through. Let's get a- into this. I'm ready. <laughs> this is this is Tim's pet topic. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is a tough one for me because you know I don't want to. I was explaining yesterday to my friend who was trying to encourage me maybe to go a little wilder. I was like, well, there's a line between sort of quirky and like Vegas on stage. There's like, <laughs> and, and that's a very dangerous place. You have to sort of. You know, and dress shirts like a dress. Ja- I mean, it so quickly goes over the line to ridiculous, and uh, it's very hard to find the sort of classy, unusual outfit choice that's also comfortable, that won't have sweat stains, that won't make look you look. I mean, there's so many problems. What's yeah, wrong? No with one just, sympathizes with our. Trouble. What's wrong with a tuxedo or a nice suit? I'm sure you'll look fantastic. A suit is boring. I, I no, find it's but, hot. I mean. <laughs> I thought Leif Ova Ansnes looked great in a suit the other day. Uh, so, you know, if you could rock it a certain way, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so something was... between something between Tails and Han Bin. Somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I think Han Bin is taking it, uh, taking it pretty far. But, you know, it's his artistic journey. Right. There's one other this season, which Lost is this coat. huge piece of, uh, for about... 25 or 30 years I've been collecting bells and so I'm working with Third Coast Percussion a wonderful group of musicians and we are doing a piece which is if I can give you a very quick outline it's like 500 pieces of metal (laughs) Wow! it's all bells and other percussion instruments like bell plates um, and button gongs and things of this kind that are generally like bells. So right. it's incredibly difficult. It's the hardest piece I've ever composed because wow. it's half an hour long and it's only metal. Wow. wow. 
Yeah, K-Time Structured there, how do you, Metal can... So how do you then take something that's... The, how do you make something that long stand up for 30 minutes when all the sounds are so similar? It's almost impossible. I'm telling you, it's the hardest piece. I've, it's the hardest piece I've ever written. Did you? One of the things that well, I've been trying to do is to focus certain sections on very limited amounts of of, of mm. bells. So, for instance, about 15 years ago or 10 years ago, I bought uh, 25 Japanese prayer bells, the Rin. Yeah. And yeah. they're beautifully tuned. And so each of the members of Third Coast is playing a collection of Rin and Crotals. So there's a whole seven minutes of the piece that's just these beautiful Rin and Crotals, just to give a quick example. And including making the bells uh, sing in different ways. Right. And then somebody else is maybe hitting a bell and somebody else is playing a motive on a bell. So it, it becomes extremely contrapuntal and very, yeah. very rich very quickly. Yeah, that's a... Yeah. Having a large group that you then focus on small portions of sounds like a Mahler thing to me. <laughs> it's it's really, one has to do that because otherwise, if you use all 500 pieces of metal all the time, it's just like the kitchen sink. Yeah. Right. It's, now, it's not a composition. So I've been really sculpting and sculpting and sculpting. And we've spent so much time together, the five of us, on this piece. I'm really excited to share it with people. They're phenomenal players, incredible technique. And uh, wonderful people. And in fact, uh, two of them are also composers. So they're really um, going on this journey with me in a very, they all are going on this journey with such positive attitude. And uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun. And the premiere of that is actually coming right up. It's oh. in the last week of September. Oh, can't wait. That that sounds yeah. really interesting to me. We'll have to. Where is that premiere? The, that was that piece was commissioned by the De Bartolo Center at Notre Dame University. Uh, one and and there are some co-commissioners which I will mention in a minute. But one of the uh, images of this piece is interdependence bells from all over the world, from every continent. Bells that have different functions. They might have religious functions or spiritual functions or they're in clocks or they're on the, the, the neck of an animal or something of this kind. And to have all these bells ringing together is really a very kind of spiritual image or a multi-faith or interdependent of universe. And this imagery um, was very much in sync with Notre Dame University's uh, interfaith uh, philosophies. Right. Hmm. And so I feel very, very blessed for the opportunity to make this piece. And they, of course, have a gorgeous, gorgeous concert hall, uh, which this piece needs, because when you have so much metal, you need to have a nice space for it. The, to all the different tunings and everywhere you hit these bells, they sound different and all kinds of overtones. And you need to find a space that really celebrates the colors. Nice. So I, I, the concert poster needs to be something like Gusty Brings the Metal or something like that. <laughs> Heavy metal. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious about this piece. You're talking about all these bells coming from different places and different cultures. Um, do you think about those different uses when you're writing for them? You talk about a bell being on the neck of an animal or being used in a particular religious ceremony. Do you, do you consider those contexts or do you just think of the sounds that they make well both i mean i think that if one just if you were to see a photograph of the setup so to speak of all of these yeah. bells it's a beautiful metaphor for all the different ways in which humans have sculpted metal into beautifully sounding objects i mean people have been doing this forever and I like that image very much. I mean, for instance, I, I have 18, or we, I should say we, have 18 uh, spinning Burmese bells. And mostly these bells are used where you just hit one of them or it make it spin in a particular sort of religious um, meditation. So it's already interesting just to have one Burmese spinning bell, but we have 18 of them, and they're all tuned differently. And it's just very, very fascinating to, to see somebody spinning one and, and hitting a chord. Someone else is hitting a chord on another. And then, uh, you know, it, it, it becomes, again, very, very contrapuntal. And yet, on the other hand, these bells are used very much for worship. And so it's 
you know, one one feels that in the piece. There's a certain kind of uh, spirituality or mantra. You know, you have people hitting 18. It's, it's become somewhat gamelan-like, a very weird gamelan. But it, it yeah. ha- does, for me, have some spiritual overtones, even though it's just metals. <laughs> And, and for, for people that are not watching the video version of our show, but listening to the audio, uh, Gusty was gesticulating a lot. And it's clear I to me, I think that you are thinking about this piece very visually and what it what it looks like when it's played. Is that is that something you think of for all your pieces or just for this one with that has a particularly unique and elaborate setup? Exactly. Well, usually when I'm writing for anybody, I'm trying to visualize what the stage would look like, whether it's the Boston Symphony with Lynn Harrell or, um, let's say, a duo or a girls chorus or wh- whatever it might be, a, a, a violin concerto for Frank Peter Zimmermann. What will that look like? So I do have images, but in this particular piece, uh, it, it's a very beautiful thing to see because it's this big array of bells and one of the things that's very interesting i guess maybe only for composers is the notation system <laughs> because it, there's so many bells that everybody that they're each playing and how to notate uh which one is played where right so uh i've developed and also with the help of third coast a really elaborate notation system <laughs> where for instance the racks upon which there might be let's say 25 bells for each musician we're using just sharps so c sharp d sharp e sharp f sharp g sharp a sharp b sharp d sharp etc all the way up so that they get to remember uh, memorize that this particular bell is c sharp that particular bell is f sharp that you know and instead of writing the name of every single bell at every single attack which right. would be the score would be unreadable right. and those of course are not the pitches that those bells sound right Exactly. We're just using it as a nomenclature. Okay. Right. Um, and then I have two scores, one with a very simple nomenclature, which is C-sharp, D-sharp, E-sharp, F-sharp, G-sharp. And then I have another score where I've marked down every single pitch. So oh it's incredibly goodness. complicated. Two full scores are being made, one that's very pitch-oriented, and one is a simplification so that they can learn it in a, in a way that uh, makes sense to them as they're going from racks to tables to things that are on the floor behind them so um the racks are sharps the tables are naturals the, anything on the floor is a flat so at the instant they see a sharp they know they're up on the racks and you know things oh. of this kind we've had to develop a, a unique notation system so it's, it sounds to me like there's there's almost kind of a, a dance involved in performing this piece with this the with the the amount of the number of bells that each player has to play and how far apart that they would have to be it's exactly true. It's, and these, these musicians in Third Coast are phenomenal, phenomenal players and perfect virtuosi. I mean, it's incredible. And uh, the switching back and forth. And then, of course, as you all know, being composers yourself, where you strike a bell gives it a different mm-hmm. color or what kind of mallet. I mean, it's like a billion choices for everything. And it, it's, uh, it's a very difficult piece to compose for that reason in, in terms of all the mallet choices and the... Uh, yeah. switches for them and it's right really, just your really just your own personal research i'm sure took forever to to go through each bell and figure out exactly how you want to hit it exactly and and we've been experimenting a lot i, I mark it in the score and then we make some changes and uh try it with a hard bell and certain bells respond really differently actually like for instance a low burma bell the big spinning burma bell will react differently to a hard mallet than a one an octave higher so it's not just that all Burma bells react to the same kind of mallet the same way. So it gets really, really nuanced. Wow. So That's did you have to rent a giant space to just set up and rehearse this piece? Yes, but thankfully Third Coast Percussion has a fabulous, huge studio with every... We have the whole setup. It's just staying set up for the summer, wow. actually. Um, because it's once you set this thing up, you don't want to tear it down. No kidding. Uh, but they, they have a beautiful studio that they've been renting for many years, which is really an inspired room because it has so many different instruments and all the drums and all kinds of things. So And it's a very organized studio, that, and it's been a joy and a privilege to work with them in their own space. So um, I'm wondering if when you got it set up and you started experimenting with actually 
making some of the sounds, did you find like problems with sympathetic vibrations affecting other things? Yes, and and one also it's it's quite interesting because you have to trust the decay of a bell. Part right. of the interest of a bell is how it's decaying. Yeah. And if you strike another bell too quickly, you ruin the the, the beautiful sound of the what you just made happen. Right. And so there's this really interesting uh, need for patience and allowing the sounds to decay and building things up in certain ways, uh, which is very, very refined. And really, one has to breathe with the piece in a very particular way to, to make it work. You can't just come in and start like pounding at all the bells. It'll just sound like the kitchen sink. Right. So I'm just curious, since you do have a score that you have the discrete pitches indicated on, I'm wondering what the tessitura of the ensemble is. That's an excellent question, because there's a lot of highs, as you would imagine. Yeah. Right. Um, and we're using four low gongs, uh, the lowest of which is the low C gong. But, you know, we don't have like a way double bass note, way, way, right, way right. down. Um, but it's very interesting when you when the low gongs are struck, it really feels very earthy. Right. Uh, and above it, the, the other bells can sort of sound, depending on which mallets are being used, like overtones of the fundamental bell, if you right. can imagine. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, so I'm, I have another question about this, this ensemble. Um, you were kind of describing a lot of your, your current and upcoming projects a few minutes ago, and most of them were for relatively standard groups of instruments. You know, you, you talked about a piece for chamber orchestra with vocalists, and you talked about a cello concerto, and those are all pieces that you can write for for this group, and then some other group can come back later and play again. Yeah, and I'm and I'm curious about how you how you feel ab about the amount of effort you're clearly having to put into this particular piece. Uh, in in light of the fact that it's going to be really hard for, or maybe even impossible for anybody other than Third Coast to play this piece. It's an excellent question, Dave. I um, this is really Third Coast's piece. I mean, absolutely. I yeah. put, we or I and we together have put so much effort into this. I can whatever amount of effort people think we put in, we put like ten times more effort. It's just so much work, um, and we're all really kind of doing it for the the love of it, as it were. But really, it's their piece, and what we're hoping is that they can play it in different places. I mean. I, I guess four trunks will be built, one trunk for each setup, so the piece can move. It can right. be shipped right. by UPS and go to New York or go to L.A. or go wherever. Yeah. Um, it's 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 movable. And it's a little tough to rent this piece out. <laughs> you can't you can't rent the piece, and also just <laughs> learning the, the the notations. In in some cases, you know, that's just a lot to. Uh, percussionists right. actually are used to learning different notation systems, but um, I think of it as their piece and. I'm just so hoping that they will be able to get invitations to bring their piece somewhere. Um, I, I know they're hoping for the same, because once you learn a piece like this, it, it's a huge effort. Hey guys, it's me again. This is not one of our best of moments, and you can tell because I'm in it. Um, I wanted to just take a minute to uh, thank everyone who has supported Sound Notion this year. Um, I, I know I say this a lot, and I'm going to stop doing this for a long time after we come back from break. Um, but I, I just want to thank everyone who has, has supported the show in whatever way they've supported the show, whether that's sharing our show with your friends and colleagues and family, or whether that's donating money to us, or whether that's just using our uh, Amazon links and our iTunes links that we have on the site. So thank you to everyone who's done that. If you would still like to do that, you of course still can. Uh, I We try really hard not to make every show include a kind of public radio begging segment. Uh, and we did it a little bit around the holidays because we know a lot of people are buying stuff. But we're going to stop for a while. Uh, so this is the last one, I promise. But... If you would like to support the show, go to our site, soundnotion.tv, uh, and there are donate links on the right side. There are links for you to search through Amazon, and we get a tiny commission for things that you buy on Amazon through our link. We really, really appreciate it. That helps us out a lot. 
Now, before we get back to the clips, there are a lot of ways to enjoy sound notion. Some of you listen to the audio, some of you listen to the video. You might get us through iTunes or some other podcast manager app. Uh, you might watch us through YouTube. Uh, and one thing that a lot of people who watch the show may not realize is that we have uh, a list of show notes. And I, if you don't watch the last 30 seconds of every episode when, in my, when, my, when I ramble on about this stuff, you may not realize that we have a list of links at the, at the end of every episode on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN. And those links are, I think, pretty darn entertaining. So uh, they're written, I, we often don't give credit, they're written most weeks by our own Sam Mercier's. Um, and, well, I'll let Sam tell you. He's going to talk about some of his, I keep pointing at the monitor like he's here. He's recording this separately. Uh, <laughs> we're going to let Sam tell you uh, some of his favorite show notes that he's written this year because they often don't get... Uh, a lot of play on the show itself, but they're really quite clever. So thanks to Sam for doing them all this year. Uh, and here's Sam to tell you a little bit about some of them. Hello, Sound Notionites. What should we call our fans anyway? Sound Notion Army? Sound Notioners? Sound Notionones? Fans of the show. I'm Sam, and I'm the guy who writes the uh, show notes, and Dave foolishly has complimented me on my show notes, both via Twitter and on the show. And as we all know, uh, a composer and saxophone player does not need his ego stroked. So uh, it's all your fault, Dave. So coming up are the top six. Um, Dave wanted me to do top five, but if you watch the show, you know that Dave and I don't always agree on how to do things. Um, top six show notes of the last year. They're not just the funniest, but sometimes the most poignant, and I uh, hope you like them. Okay, number one is from Sound Notion 58, where we were lucky enough to get a uh, vocalist, composer, and uh, football fan, music writer, Carrie Andrew from Across the Pond on the show. Um, we were featuring a story about uh, the DSO and Kid Rock offering to um, do a show with the DSO to raise money because as we all know every orchestra uh, in the country is sucking on rocks to stay alive. Cellos! A little more ba wa t ba da da bang a bang diggy diggy said the boogie said ump jump the boogie said Leonard Slotkin Kid Rock supports the DSO. If you didn't get that, that's a line from a Kid Rock song. So Dave probably didn't know what it was, but so that's what it was. It turns out that they did raise a million dollars. Um, the tickets were going from like a hundred to three hundred dollars or three hundred and fifty dollars a pop, and they sold the theater out and raised a million bucks for the DSO. So, thank you, Kid Rock. Number two. Number two is from Sound Notion eighty one. Doctor's office music. When pianos are sent to die. Warning, graphic images of piano violence help stop the madness. We featured a story uh, about um, pianos uh, being hauled off and dumped in the trash because uh, people are just unwilling to um, you know, go through the trouble of going and picking them up and having them retuned and everything. And it's just gotten to the point where people don't care as much and uh, there's a company that basically goes and gets pianos and takes them to the dump. And it's uh, pretty horrifying, especially if you're a music student, to see these scenes of pianos being tossed out of the back of trucks and everything. And um, there's actually a link um, that I included where you can uh, sort of adopt a piano and you can do it by region. So you can find pianos that are headed for um, the dump or the piano morgue in your area, and we'll have a link to that. Number three! The third show note on our countdown is uh, from Sound Notion 61. We had friend of the show uh, Danny Felsenfeld from New York on the... <laughs> Recording stuff like this is hard. It's entitled The Talking Part of an Opera because... 
I had a brain fart and I couldn't remember the word libretto for some reason. Now this one is actually sort of controversial um, because recently on the show I proclaimed that Rob Deemer, friend of the show Rob Deemer, has the strongest beard in new music. Well, I didn't remember that uh, Danny had uh, come up with quite a strong beard of his own um, since the last time we had seen him when he came on for episode 61. Daniel Felsenfeld joins the panel to plug his new beard. Uh, I mean, libretto. The fourth note in our countdown... Blah, stop looking at the microphone, Sam! The fourth note in our countdown is actually two notes that are very similar, which is why I'm saying this is a top six instead of a top five countdown the way Dave wanted me to do it. From episode 91, entitled Actual News, I was trying to be funny since we didn't have a guest, and uh, we had featured a story about the Pittsburgh Symphony um, doing a show that was all Michael Jackson, including uh, a Michael Jackson impersonator. There were varied opinions on this, but I'm like, if you can make money doing it, you go, orchestra. The Pittsburgh Symphony hopes to moonwalk all the way to the bank. From episode 95, entitled Two R's, No I, we featured a story about the Detroit Symphony, who also was doing a show similar to the Pittsburgh Symphony, where um, you have to assume they're just hoping to cash in. The Detroit Symphony has its best box office ever, thanks to the benevolence of the Queen. Fans in the audience. Of course, that's in reference to the Detroit Symphony doing an all-Queen show, and they did the biggest box office they've ever done. Like I said, if you can make money at it, you go. The fourth note in our countdown is from Sound Notion 52, uh, entitled Snarkosphere. We featured a story, uh, well, multiple stories about SOPA and PIPA. Uh, if you don't know what those are, um, you should look them up. SOPA and PIPA. Sopapia? This is, of course, in reference to sopapias, which are this great uh, sort of uh, fried uh, tortilla-like sort of New Mexican donut thing that they put honey on. There's a link in the show notes, so you can just look it up yourself. It's delicious, though. So I hate to admit it, but one of the best notes of the year was uh, basically a quote from pop culture. We want to point out what cheap, lying, no good, rotten, four-flushing, low-life, snake-licking, dirt-eating, inbred, overstuffed, ignorant, blood-sucking, dog-kissing, brainless, hopeless, heartless, fat-ass, bug-eyed, stiff-legged, spotty-lipped, worm-headed sacks of monkey business they are. Your representatives agree. SOPA and PIPA uh, were two pieces of legislation being put forth that would seriously curtail um, internet freedom, let's put it. So uh, you should read about them. If you don't get that reference, by the way, you're either a teenager or your name is Dave McDonald. And the number one show note of 2012... sweet single stroke roll, you have to admit. The number one show note of 2012 is from episode 85. Um, if you watch the show, you also know that uh, in addition to internet freedom, um, I love to villainize media conglomerates because basically they want to take over the world. And so we were featuring a story about uh, Universal Music Group trying to purchase EMI. We had talked about it, uh, you know, when it was in process and then it actually happened. Universal Music gets their grubby hands on EMI. Of course, that's General Veers talking to the panel of evil dudes and Darth Vader in one of the opening scenes of Star Wars, Episode 4, uh, where they're talking about uh, restructuring things so that people know who is in charge. Well, I think you can tell what I think about EMI uh, being purchased by Universal Music Group by that quote. And if you don't know how I feel about that purchase based on that quote, then you're, well, I mean, if you're a teenager, you would still know it. So if you don't understand what it means, then you're Dave McDonald. So a special thank you to Sam for putting those together. I think probably uh, I will start paying a lot more attention to the show notes myself now after seeing that. So thanks so much for all your work. Uh, we want to kick you back over to some of our favorite moments of this year. We had some 
as I said earlier, some really great people. One of the things that we have not had, I, I don't think, before this year is a live performance. So you're going to hear coming up now uh, an, an excerpt of a, a, a live performance from an interview we did with Anthony DeMar. And, uh, well, he was on his Skype uh, laptop from over Wi-Fi and Skype sometimes does some weird things with the audio. And that's part of why I want to play this. Because I think it's kind of interesting what Skype does with the sound. Um, but if it sounds like maybe the reel-to-reel tape we're listening to has broken, it has not. Skype has just had a had a little conniption. Um, but it's something that I, I would love to, to do some more of. is some, some more live performance on the show. So we'll check out a little Tony Marr and a couple more of these before we go. I'll see you back at the end of the show. Everybody got a list of what I called my wish list of songs, although I told them okay. they didn't have to, to that because um, some of them did come forward with songs that they felt strongly about. And I wanted them to, you know, I wanted them as being part of the project to feel an affinity of some sort towards his music. I didn't want them to do it just for the gig. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and so a lot of them did have their choices, but some of them did review a lot on the list. And, you know, some, of course, liked many of them and had to narrow it down for themselves. But what they would do is after we chose a song, we would talk a little about it, but then they went forward. In the case, again, of so many, I would get a phone call a couple months later saying, uh, <clears throat> this is really kind of difficult. Uh, I need to talk to you. <laughs> um, and um, in the case of John Musto, which I think is just one of the most amazing cases, is someone who uh, took it, you know, really discernedly uh, – uh, went through the songs and came up with one of the most difficult songs, which was Epiphany, um, that Sweeney Todd sings at one of the most crucial points in Act One of Sweeney Todd. Um, he chose this, and he chose some of the other darker music, and he decided to combine them all together. And uh, about two months, two and a half months into it, I got three months almost, I got a call from him saying, or an email saying, he thinks he might have to drop out because this is just too hard and he doesn't think what he's doing because he feels like he's meandering. He said he'd written a few pages, but it wasn't. he wasn't sure if this was going to be the right thing. And based on what I was asking him to do, he just didn't know, and et cetera, et cetera. So I asked him to send me those pages. Well, he sent me the three pages he had done, and they, they were ex- actually quite brilliant. Uh, and he was on to something quite wonderful. And I showed it to the producer, and we went, we talked about it. And I wrote him back and said, I really think you're on to something. You should continue with your instinct here. And he said, well, okay. He had to finish up an opera that he was doing out in Santa Fe. And when he came back about uh, two months later, he sends me this piece that is just wonderful. It's very dramatic. Uh, it encompasses the material. Uh, it's a real piano piece. Uh, Because he's a real pianist. I mean, he really, you know, he knows. And I thought this was going to, I thought he was going to be one of the composers. That This was going to be simply one of the easiest exercises for anyone to do. And it was ended up being the one having the most trouble with it. And again, there were others. Uh, Daniel Bernard Romain called me last summer saying, he goes, he was driving his wife at the time. He was driving her crazy by playing the song over and over and over again. (laughs) (laughs) And then he said, he goes, I find, I found the ISO rhythm that I wanted to use, and I found what I was going to do with it, and then it all just played, basically wrote itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think in case of that, there were always conversations. And then we had this ritual whereby when they sent me the piece, I would learn it, and then they would always uh, come over to hear it for the first time, would, even in its roughest form of my playing. And the producer always wanted to be here, too. She wanted to be part of it, too, for these first sessions, just for all our interaction and all that, to sort of observe and experience it. That's great. And that, those were always fun. Uh, I wish we had more video of those sessions because some of them were actually a lot of fun. And um, and then from that point, um, they just sort of left it to me to, you know, give it its birth, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> um, a funny word getting back to Ethan Iverson, because um, yeah. you mentioned Ethan. Um, it was curious that Sending the Clowns was on the list from the beginning, and no one chose it for three years. Now, oh, Bill Bolton yeah. took the opening phrase, and he also took the opening phrase of the song Anyone Can Whistle, and he combined them as a, a short little fugue. So one is subject, one is counter subject. Mm-hmm. And um, he combines them as this, this lovely little sort of night, he calls it a little night fugetta. Um, and with yeah, that, that. Sounds interesting. 
um, that was the only minimal use of the, the main theme or phrase from Send in the Clowns. And then another composer, Bernadette Speech, also just sort of referenced it because she set the song Liaisons from A Little Night Music. But she also referenced A Little Night Music, I mean, uh, Send in the Clowns, but not setting it exactly. So it stayed on the list. And then Ethan wrote in his, the heading of his email was, can it be true? And then his first <laughs> email was, um, I don't believe it. Send in the Clowns is still free. He says, by all means, I'm going to snatch this one up. So... Um, he took it and he did what I think is an extremely unusual setting. He said it was going to be unusual. He reimagined it as being played in a cabaret or a club. And on the stage is a very, oh, if you will, an older pickup band of musicians. And there's this kind of um, this melody or this introduction that they play that keeps repeating itself through the piece. It keeps coming back. It's a kind of ant antiphonal thing. Um, in the background. And then there's this piano soloist who is off to the side on an old beat-up upright piano um, that is trying to play the song Send in the Clowns. So what we have is we have the opening of this band playing this tune that has nothing to do with Send in the Clowns, and then the pianist coming in very quietly trying to play Send in the Clowns, and then he's interrupted three more times by the band playing this this antiphon as if the conductor's like sitting there trying to bring back the band as much as <laughs> each time the pianist has his solo it's a little bit more uh sometimes it's a little bit more unusual uh in its setting sometimes it's more poignant sometimes it's funny um so it's always a a, a, a kind of different um uh setting of the song but at the same time still maintaining the pathos of what the song is actually about um actually uh we were talking before we started uh, recording that you actually are prepared to give us a short excerpt of that piece. And I'm going to go ahead and request it because I'm a huge fan. He's calling it in. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'll play you a little part of it, but I'm going to see if I can put the computer. Tell me if this has affected anything. Um, this is a sound notion first. <laughs> that's beautiful. Go. Yeah, that's that's. Brilliant. You see that? That's it's perfect. perfect. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to play a first, like, page and a half or so. Okay.
I'll stop there. That's great. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Such a treat. I think a lot of them have to do with just the relationships in the school that I teach at. Yeah, it certainly is a great school. I mean, we see a lot of great artists come out of Curtis and we're happy you can teach composition to as many people as you do. <laughs> it's really fantastic. I used to teach a really great class there, 20th Century Music, actually, where I managed to get everybody in the school at some point because it was a required class. And that was a history theory class. And I spent the whole year lecturing these kids about uh, commissioning. So <laughs> I, I kind of miss that, but it, it pays off in a certain way because I think I'm hoping the person who's taken it over, David Ludwig, who's also a composer, Mm -hmm. does the same thing. So I'm always telling them they are responsible to commission works from composers. This is like the number one message of the class. Yeah. That's I'm so nice. happy to hear that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's something that's very cool to, to get students involved with early on is working with composers. Um, and I'm, I'm curious with all these different collaborations that you do, how closely through the process are you working with um, the the soloist. I'm thinking particularly of the the concertos. We're going to talk about a, a concerto later in the show, um, and one of our our past picks of the week, maybe even our first ever pick of the week. I'm not sure. It was pretty close. Was uh, on a wire. Um, so I, I'm curious how closely you work with these musicians when 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 they commission you. Yeah, you know what? It's uh, I work with them pretty closely in the beginning. I ask them a ton of questions about what they want in their piece. Um, as you guys know, being composers, you can design anything the, any way you want. And my pieces tend to change according to the performer that's involved. I will find out if there's something specific they want in a piece. One of the things Eighth Blackbird said, the piece you mentioned on a wire, they said they wanted to be able to move around on a orchestra stage. This is a concerto for orchestra and those guys. And I thought, wow, it's going to be kind of crowded in the front of the stage anyway, when you've got a piano, a percussion, and then you've got four other players. I was sitting there thinking, how the heck am I going to move them around? Because they, they're fantastic about acting when they play. Mm -hmm. And uh, ironically, just thinking about that, because at first I said, oh, guys, we can't have you move around. There's not going to even be space. But then I thought, oh, I could have them zip line down from the back of the auditorium. That might be kind of <laughs> cool. But I realized in thinking about that, why couldn't I have them all just move over to the piano and play inside the piano? I thought that seems like that would be manageable. If you've got a grand piano on the stage, surely everyone can fit around it. And so I decided, yeah, I could have them moving. But that's what kind of gave me the idea to actually start the piece with them all playing inside the piano. And to make that sound valid, I have them go back. But usually with these pieces, I end up talking a lot to them in the beginning, and then I just go off and write, and I will send them individual movements as I finish them, or I wait. If it's a single movement work like On a Wire was, I'll wait till the, to the point where I've finished enough of it that I can send to them. And in the case of A Blackbird, I actually flew into Chicago before the premiere to to really work with them because I wasn't sure some of these effects were going to work. I, I can mimic some of them in my studio, but you know, I'm only one person. So I'm trying to figure out how do you run around the piano? If you have a mallet, can you pick up a guitar pick while other people right. are bowing and doing crazy things? So I try things out with various people. Um, and then I make adjustments and I'm often still making adjustments to things if I think it needs to be adjusted. So I get to know the players really well, though. I like get all their recordings. I attend rehearsals if I can. I just try to get a sense of their personalities. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun. Right. Do they? Do you think any of these people believe you're a bit micromanagerial like that? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> amazingly not. Really good okay. artists that tend to let you do your own they, thing. I mean, they could just be, be being nice. Yeah, that's true. But I think <laughs> know now they're like, well, I'm always telling them, go ahead and tell me if there's an issue. It was funny when I was writing the violin concerto for Hilary Hahn. I, I would send her a movement and she kept saying, you can make it harder. You can make it harder. And I kept thinking, good grief. My stuff is actually pretty hard. It's, it's, it looks simpler on the page, but when you have to execute it, it's a, a totally different thing. But Hillary kept pushing to make it harder. Oh, wow. it, and so it got to the point when I when I wrote the first movement, which is the last thing I wrote, I was like trying to trip her up. I was trying yeah. to see how hard I could make it just as a challenge. It was kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, the composers, I mean, uh, performers might be careful what they ask for sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. The, the time for three guys were like, oh, yeah, no problem, write anything. And then uh, when I sent them their concerto, they said, Wow, Jen, this is really hard. And I, I said, 
dudes, it's a concerto. So, Jennifer, one of the questions we normally ask when the show starts is, tell us what's up. But that is such a complicated question for you because uh, you're the hardest working woman in, in com- composer biz, it seems like. Um, looking at your website, you've got a lot of stuff going on. One thing I'm curious about is um, the opera that's going to be premiered in Santa Fe based on Cold Mountain. Have you done much work on it yet? or? Yeah, you know, I have uh, I started it last February, and I'm almost to the end of the first act. I've been actually writing throughout the summer, writing every single day, usually seven to nine hours a day. It's a, it's a lot. It's been wow, very wow. Awesome. But, you know, and I've discovered opera is so big, you have to dedicate that kind of time to it. There's, like, no getting around it at all. And so, but I'm having a good time doing it. This is my first time in opera. So what I'm having to do is actually research things. Like, I'll get into a section. I'm like, I don't know how long to allow for somebody to be buried alive. So, so I, <laughs> I calculate, well, how long does it take to actually bury someone alive? Um, <laughs> Take the change is set. Really, I'm constantly asking people. And uh, so the first act is within a couple of weeks of being done, amazingly. So it's scheduled to be premiered in 2015, but delivery dates for opera are much earlier, a right. whole lot earlier. So, but uh, it's kind of fascinating because I'm doing residencies this year with a couple of different orchestras. So I'm trying to figure out with the traveling, how do I manage composing? Because I kind of have to stay on track. Um, how to manage that. And that's that's kind of an interesting balancing act, how to, to figure out how to do your schedule while writing every day. It's, that's that's so easy. Sorry, yeah. that, that reminds me of a question that I had for you, um, reading about all of, all of the things that you do. Uh, when do you sleep? Because <laughs> you're, you're, you're writing so much music and you, you have these, these residencies and you teach at Curtis. Um <laughs> How do you how do you balance all all of those responsibilities? That sounds like to me that sounds like a lot of stuff to take care of. Yeah, you know it's interesting. I should first say that my teaching at Curtis, everyone at Curtis is adjunct, so I only teach two hours a week. Okay. It, and there's no one at the school full time. I think there's maybe the liberal arts person who has liberal arts there. I think is the one full time individual. But I only have two students now. Once I started all the traveling, I had to drop the classes because I couldn't yeah. be there. So, so that makes it a little bit easier, but I'm also famous for not being able to sleep. So <laughs> it's a, it's, it's kind of a problem. I wish I could sleep more because I need a break from my brain, which is really super active, a little too active, but I try to squeeze things in. I mean, right now I'm working seven days a week. It's not, there aren't any breaks yeah. and, uh, and that's probably not the smartest thing in reality, but, uh, <laughs> but sometimes, yeah, you know, it's, when you agree to do residencies, your people contact you a couple of years earlier and you think, Oh yeah, that sounds easy. I, I can go, you know, visit with this orchestra for a week. Then when you get into the year, suddenly you look at the calendar and you're like, Oh, I've got quite a few of these and uh, right. to manage that stuff is insane. Balance is probably not a word that's in my schedule though. I probably need to get better. <laughs> about that. So uh, I, I, I want to make it clear that we're all composers and uh, none of us feel sorry for you. Not even one little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I do it to myself. I agree to do these things, and then I'm like, you know, and I'm lucky because I actually get to do them. I think that's the the bigger thing. I had an interesting thing at the end of last season. The Cincinnati Symphony has been without a music director for the past like two years. They just recently named someone. But for the intervening two years, they decided to ask a composer, a conductor, and a performer to design their their actual concert programs. So I agreed to do this. I think Philip Glass did it last year. So it's been kind of fascinating to watch orchestral programming, how they put that together. Um, I've learned a whole lot, but it's been a considerable amount of work. So I'll spend actually two different visits to Cincinnati, two weeks where they're doing pieces of mine. But I I kind of marvel at the entire process of the orchestra world. How do they decide what kind of pieces they're going to put on a program? What do they weigh that with? What does the conductor want to do? What does the soloist want to do? So it's been kind of an education. And sometimes I take things that I just want to learn about how it, how something might work. But okay. you're right. I definitely overcommit myself. And maybe I probably need to fix that. <laughs> with, with all your traveling, I'm really curious. Like, 
so you you write seven to nine hours a day, but you travel to do all these different residencies. Are you are you able to, like, just with your 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 way of composing, are you able to write on the road and and do that kind of thing? Yeah. Do you need your Do you need your own little shell and desk at home to really write, or or are you okay doing it on the go? You know. I- Actually, I've learned to do it on the go. I travel with a laptop and a, a, one of those chintzy roll-up keyboards, you know, you see on late night TV around yeah. Christmas. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Are we going to see you on an ad for one of those pretty soon or something? I could actually do that. I could speak <laughs> on it. I do write on the road unless it's a residency where I'm really busy and I realize that the only thing I'm going to do on the road is actually do parts or something like that because I do my own parts and such. So, but when I was flying down to Fort Worth the other day, I've been so engaged in the opera. I found that um, I was able to kind of write ideas on the plane all the way down. I don't have perfect pitch and I have to have a keyboard in hand, but my kind of the way I hear in my head has gotten more clear with practice and time. And so I can sit down and write things out. I I think I fill the legal pad with ideas for one of the scenes I'm about to do in the opera. So... But it's squeezing things in. You know, you can do a lot of parts when you're on a plane or you're sitting in a, you're sitting in an airport. And and this is often when I listen to your show. I have these things down. Like, I'll just listen to Sound Notion. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you a are do you, are you a paper and pencil composer when it comes to the actual notation, or a straight into the computer person? Actually, both. Because I, I started out doing it paper and pencil, and I still do an extraordinary amount of sketching. Um, I have like notebooks. Um, I always have notebooks with me of some sort, music notebooks and just plain notebooks where I can write things down with words. But I do actually do short scores in uh, the computer. Even for orchestra pieces, I do short scores. And then I orchestrate. So I say probably 85% of it's in the computer and 15 is handwritten. Mm, that's interesting. Um, do you think that it's had an effect on the way your music sounds? Because this is a, with some composers, this is a, a thing they want to debate. It, you know what? It's been interesting because as I, when I've judged competitions through the years, I have noticed that computers have taken over the process. You can actually see it in the music. Um, I think it probably has helped my sound because I'm an awful pianist, so I can't, I can't play all the lines that I write because sometimes I'll have like 12 different lines going at once. There's no way I can play that on the piano. I struggle with two lines. So um, the, the computer has helped me in that way, and I think it has made it easier for me to do bigger pieces a little quicker, especially when I think about the parts. Because when I was going through uh, Bowling Green, we actually used to do a manuscript class you know, with ink and a pen, and, yeah. rulers, and the rulers had pennies taped to the bottom so you wouldn't smear the ink everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I am so appreciative of computers. I feel like my life is so much better because of them. Because uh, <laughs> I think it ruined my back and my eyesight doing it by hand. I tell you, all those years, so much easier to revise now too. It used mm-hmm. to be like, oh, oh yeah, definitely. You no, know, to take a measure out or add a measure, forget it. If you were doing it by hand, it just wasn't worth it. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, uh, Dave pointed out something earlier this morning that I think we all appreciate. Speaking of scores, is you sell uh, study scores. Ah. I think that's a that's a big thing. <laughs> well, I mean, from a from a selfish point of view, if you want your music to become canonized at all, making your scores easy for people to get their hands on and look at and appreciate in that way, a looking at the music kind of way, you know, I think is a good thing. And it's just appreciated by people that want to see how that noise happened, you know, that kind of thing. You know what? Part of this came out of the fact that uh, when I was a student, I was so frustrated because I couldn't get scores. Yes. I couldn't- and I, you know, people are like, oh, it's a rental only. And I never understood the logic of that. I thought, well, if you're having a hard time getting your music performed, shouldn't you try to get the scores out there somehow? Right. I'm so glad I did it, though, because my music publishing business has, has grown and grown. And we get like five or six orders a day now for scores. And I'm, right. I'm shocked by the volume. But I'm also kind of appreciative of the fact that people are curious about things. Uh, same with the chamber music. I didn't know this, but the publishing houses, they rent a lot of their chamber music. I don't ever rent chamber music. I just sell it. But it means a lot of music gets out there and people will buy it. And then they hang on to it till it's a good time to play it. Sometimes it's not always optimal, but they may need to look at it to figure out if it fits their group. So it turned out to be a, an accidental thing. 
Actually, it was because no publisher would take me, so I thought, well, I'll just do it. <laughs> we, we love the DIY quality. Um, <clears throat> absolutely. Um, I had a question and it just slipped because well, my brother called and I had to ignore the phone call. Sorry. I, I, uh, I was going to ask you a question. This kind of relates to what we were talking about earlier, how you you have all these questions that you, you ask of the musicians that you're working with and you you try to, to tailor the, the piece to the, the kinds of music that they like to play um, and the sorts of goals that they have for the piece. And maybe this is the source of um, the tremendous variety that I hear in your music. I, one thing that, that always strikes me when, when I listen to your music is that it's each piece is distinctive. Um, and it certainly sounds related to your other music. I mean, it sounds like your music. Yeah. But at the same time, um, the, the piece we're going to listen to today sounds completely different um, than On a Wire. For example, um, so can you can you speak a little bit to that the the, the variety that you have in in your oeuvre? Yes, <laughs> I like the way you said that. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's that a lot of times the commissioners will tell me they want something very specific. The piece that you're going to play today, Concerto Four Three, the Philadelphia Orchestra came to me, which sounds funny now that I say that Philadelphia Orchestra came to me. <laughs> <laughs> They said, uh, we want something that has a bluegrass flavor to it that shows up time for three guys, but it's going to be on a program with Tchaikovsky. They actually said that. <laughs> I thought, God, can I do this? Um, what I found fascinating, though, is what time for three would play would be very different than what Hilary Hahn would play in a violin concerto. And Hilary's was the next piece I wrote after doing this bluegrass thing. So, and the, week, and the piece after that happened to be the, the piece for Eighth Blackbird. Eighth Blackbird does a lot of extended techniques, and they'll try anything on the instrument. So, of course, I had to use extended techniques in that, but extended techniques wouldn't work for Hillary at all. Right. Hillary was very explicit about no improvising. At that time, she wasn't doing any improvising. Whereas the time for three guys said they wanted to do uh, a lot of improvisation in the piece, but we ran into this situation where they thought they were going to have like probably six, seven weeks together to be able to improvise on this concerto if I would lay down kind of a, a base for them to work with. But what happened was Zach DePue, one of the violinists, got a job with the Indianapolis Symphony, and he became concertmaster, which meant suddenly he was going to have to stay in Indianapolis right up to the point where we were going to do the concerto. And it, it occurred to me that they wouldn't have enough time to put together a 25-minute concerto, the amount of improvisation. So I made the decision to write something that sounds like there's a lot of improvisation, but I actually wrote a lot of it out. And I tried to make sure it was had some characteristics of bluegrass, which was kind of an interesting thing for me because I grew up in East Tennessee. And so I was around bluegrass as a kid, but I didn't pay any attention to it because I was the typical. <laughs> That's not cool. Give me some rock. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I had to figure out how to give them little spots of controlled improvisation. Uh, but I had to write most of it out because I didn't want to take a chance of sitting down with the Philadelphia Orchestra. If we didn't have much rehearsal time, which it turns out we actually didn't have much rehearsal time, I knew those guys wouldn't be able to put together a 25-minute concerto improvising. I mean, that's kind of an unrealistic thing to expect. So I try to capture the personality of the players and it, it means a slightly different harmonic language sometimes. It means that the lines have to be different. It means that even the rhythms sometimes have to be different. Um, I, sometimes I do things for like middle school. I actually sometimes will do a project for a middle school. It's like working for those guys. That's the hardest thing for me is doing something for yeah. middle because the limitations are extraordinary. I mean, it's like don't go beyond an eighth note and every instrument can only do like a fifth, the interval of a fifth. Right. <laughs> So tricky. But and, and they have to look at their fingering charts for anything that's not in the B-flat major scale. <laughs> I'll exploit that because when I wrote something for middle school band, I noticed the kids love to beat on things. They love to play percussion. So I actually created something where they could take their pencils and play on the music stands. And I remember thinking, God, the, the band director is going to kill me because there's going to be kids beating on things in the band room. So, but it turned out all right. <laughs> That also requires them all to bring a pencil to rehearsal, which is something. 
There you go. I was thinking about that, you know, having uh, having stood in front of a wind ensemble myself because I'm also a conductor. I, and how many times I said, where's your pencil? <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, exactly. <laughs> So that's going to do it for our best of 2012 show. And that's going to do it for Sound Notion for 2012, another year in the books. Uh, it's been a big year for us. As I said earlier, we've gotten to talk to a lot of people that when we started this, we would never have imagined that we would get to talk to on our show. And that has been really uh, a huge thrill to us. Um, it's been a big year for all of us personally. I'm pretty sure all four of the, the regular panelists have moved at least once. Some of us have moved across town. Others of us have moved across the country. Um, and it's been really great to, to keep this going uh, and you know maintain our community with you all who, who enjoy watching and listening to the show. So thank you so much for being a part of our year. It's been really great. So raise a glass of wassail or this is coffee, but whatever it is you're drinking. Uh, and here's to another great year at Sound Notion. Have a wonderful holiday season. Uh, and we will see you back, I think, uh, January... Oh goodness! I should have I should have looked this up. This is always the problem with Sound Notion. We start the show and have no idea what we're gonna say. January sixth, we'll be back uh, as usual at 11 a.m. Eastern time, uh, and you can watch us at SoundNotion.tv/live. You can subscribe to us on iTunes, subscribe to us on YouTube, and do all the things that I always say at the end of every episode. If you want to know what I want to say right now, just you know watch the last 30 seconds of any Sound Notion episode. Uh, Thank you so much for being a part of our show for the last year. And um, we will see you back on January 6th. Have a great holiday season.